Thank you for joining the ones changing the world which is India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast and today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Stefan Lawrence Sogner who teaches philosophy at John Cabot University and as director and co-founder of the Beyond Humanism Network fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies IIT and research fellow of at the Yowa Institute for the Humanities at Yowa Women's University in Seoul is the academic advisor of Humanity Plus and visiting fellow at the Ethics Center of the Frederick Schiller University in Jena. He is editor of more than 10 essay collections and authored various monographs. In addition, he is editor in chief and founding editor of the Journal of Post-Human Studies. And today the subject of our conversation is going obviously going to be transhumanism and post-humanism. So, Stefan really really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Technologies as they converge is becoming more and import- more and more important and adding real world values and it it's kind of changing us uh, the, the entire human race one step at a time. And I think we need to take a pause and understand that these technologies are so potent and how they are changing us and possibly maybe like in the next few decades you know maybe we'll be evolving but and and that's the way life has always been you know we we humans have always evolved uh yes i mean you know there are these pros and cons you know when when these technology stack comes together and there are these uh institutions which is which is more like you know the 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 uh the churches and the politics uh and the education who are a little maybe look at it in a lens which is where they need to in, in a very traditional lens but like you said i mean the world is completely changing so i i i i think it'll be great if you could start from explaining what transhumanism is you know because uh that that i mean you know that there is you know as soon as you kind of type transhumanism on uh youtube or google there is so much negativity so it would be great if if you could give your views of what transhumanism is and why does the world look at it in, in at a way, in a very negative lens yeah thanks a lot for the question because actually yes in, in particular in recent years um uh, sort of transhumanism has got a, a lot of bad criticism in particular also from quite some you know political leaders um the first time and but on the one hand sort of one of the the decisive criticism which took place uh was was presented by Francis Fukuyama so a leading leading political commentator when he was asked in the beginning of the 2000s what is the world's most dangerous idea he said it's transhumanism his response was then in the recent years you can see sort of comments by 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 leaders and sort of one of the you four thinkers of Eurasian orthodoxy in 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 Moscow Dugin um um he presents transhumanism as the idea of the devil so it's it's being associated with um democracy liberalism and the lgbtqia movement in the same spirit uh, what is being presented is kuril um the patriarch of of Moscow he also sees he sees um, transhumanism in the same manner this year um there is a book coming out in the United States with a preface by Steve Bannon Steve Bannon advisor to Trump uh, and he also saw sort of identified transhumanism well he identified with the globalist taking over the world so you can see leading uh, fl- political thinkers always presenting transhumanism in a very negative manner um but and 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 the, and, and in in some of the presentations actually there's a crane of truth and there's some challenges related to transhumanism but what transhumanism is really is about it was founded in 1951 the term was coined by Julian Huxley in 1951 he was a he was the first general president of the U- U- united nations um uh, uh, um and and he was he was involved in formulating the human rights the declaration of human rights so it has to do with liberalism it has to do with with affirming the human rights and that's a central part of what uh, what transhumanism is all about we we are not the ones um who who are seen as 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 categorically separate from the solely natural world in the, in, in the sense it is justified it is justified that we are superior to all the other animals that we are superior 
to to nature that we are superior to AI that says something which makes us stick out um, and and sort of us being the the only entities which are worthy of moral consideration so with transhumanism it goes along with the post-human paradigm shift in the sense that we take on a new more humble self-understanding of what it means to be human that it's not just all about anthropocentrism it's, it's actually movement away from anthropocentrism that we we need to take seriously all the other all non-human animals um, in particular if they they have morally relevant capacities just like is maybe even even sufficiently developed ai needs Need to be um, need to receive the same moral recognition as 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 all the other persons if they develop morally relevant capacities if there is a morally for example the possibility of suffering of um, of a, a embodied AI can be realized so so one of the decisive terms is we're turning away from an anthropocentric understanding which only sees human as the center um, um, of the earth and everything must be justified by reference only to human interests. So, it, so it's a more humble understanding. Firstly, secondly, it takes seriously an evolutionary understanding. So, evolutionary understanding in the sense that we humans have come about as part of the evolutionary process, but we humans have come about in in all its manners. There's nothing coming from outside. So we are the same, we are the result of, you, of, of evolution in the same way as, the, as chimpanzees are, as dolphins are, as magpies are. 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens came about. About 6 million years ago, the last common ancestors of, of, of humans and crepes, uh, crate apes existed. And the question is, so where will we be in 300,000 years, in 6 million years? And it's, it's highly likely that, um, um, that we, will, we will not be there any, anymore. We will either have evolved further or we will have died out. And, and traditionally, all the evolutionary processes were dependent on 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 natural selection, and now we, we're slowly uh, getting control over it. We, we we slowly realize that it's possible for us to influence, to enhance evolution by means of human selection. We can we can make decisions. We can reduce the likelihood of species um, of persons dying out we can increase the likelihood of personal flourishing and that has, has an enormous amount of potential for increasing the plurality great plurality of personal flourishing and that it, it is important to keep in mind that um, this is something um, which has already brought about an enormous amount of benefit globally. So, in the if we if we just look back two hundred years, two hundred years, the average life expectancy on Earth was about forty years. In the meantime, it's it's sort of the global life expectancy has increased to about eighty years, and that is not just something which is in the interest of sort of the of the more developed world of the more de de developed country but even in, in in the you know countries like Nigeria um, um you know they have a significantly increased life expectancy much higher than it used to be 200 years ago sort of in 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 Europe for example so so the increased life expectancy is a consequence um, of all the developments which have taken place and all these innovations are technological innovations in the sense in in a broad sense technologies are related to education are related to you know having access to clean water having um, having access to having access to medical insurances better ma medical practices uh, pr um, things like antibiotic vaccinations have been developed like anesthetics all these things happened in the past 250 years and as a consequence so life expectancy globally has increased significantly and maybe what is maybe even more important so about 200 years we had a absolute poverty rate and i'm i'm, I'm consciously talking about an absolute poverty rate um, of more than 90 percent so 200 years ago more than more than you know 
nine out of 10 people were daily struggling to survive, just having some food to eat, just having, you know, having having to have a shelter, a warm place to sleep in. Um, even in a developed country like like England, it was it was it was more than 80% who who were who were in the state of absolute poverty still 200 years ago and and then we look at our world in data and who gives very precise empirical statistics concerning the various developments global developments which have taken place and here we can see now we've got an absolute poverty rate of of about 10% globally so um, that is an in an, an enormous improvement. So it's still not per perfect. Obviously, you know there's still like ten percent of the world's population which is which is suffering, which is uh, struggling to survive. And again, I'm talking about not about relative poverty. I, I, I talk about absolute poverty rate, which means the same criteria have been applied are being applied now as they've been applied two hundred years ago. So it is it is much better now with respect to the absolute poverty rate than it was two hundred years ago, and that was in the time. When when many of the significant technological developments have taken place. So that is that is a wonderful achievement. So we've increased our life expectancy in all parts of the world and, and the absolute poverty rate significantly dropped. And that is in the interest, you know, in 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 in, in for 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 persons all over the world. And here we can see um, here we can see a significant development. And the further development, which also needs to be taken into consideration, is that um, sort of in the beginning of the 2000 years, for the first time, um, there have been more democratic countries in the world than there have been authoritarian countries. And that, again, is another wonderful development. So, of course, not everything... Um, not every country which self-identifies as a democratic country fulfills the understanding of a democracy, maybe from from a central European context. However, that 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 is not the decisive factor. The important factor is that that they self that the country self -ident and uh, identify as democratic. So there's a movement from more authoritarian leaves towards a more um, towards more democratic regimes. A higher life expectancy, um, a, a lower absolute poverty rate, and that goes along with many further insights. So you've got cleaner water, you have more education, more access to medical insurances, and as a consequence, that leads again to lower a lower reproductive rate. And there are wonderful studies by Max Roser from the University of Oxford. Um, and he's basically showed together with all these uh, better quality of life, better education, cleaner water, uh, more uh, access to reproductive medicine, to other medical insurances. That also means there's 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 um, it, there's a decrease of the reproductive rate. So as a consequence, so the challenges which go along with a, you know, overpopulation um so if we improve the quality of life of people it clearly shows the reproductive rate goes down so the issue of the overpopulation doesn't have to be become a, a challenging one so this is if 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 i was asked why why transhumanism so it's a it's a more humble self understanding of what it means to be a human uh, a more realistic and more probable one we don't have to refer to to some strange entities which are non -emp not empirically accessible or something immaterial floating around firstly the second uh, the second decides is we take humans seriously uh, we take we uh, as as solely evolutionary beings and as a consequence we also have to face the, re the issue of dying out of extinction and we can do something about it by means of 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 our intervention of by means of enhancing evolution we can increase the quality of uh, life all over the world and we've shown this to be the case by means of a higher um, higher average life expectancy by a lower absolute poverty rate and by increasing the quality of life globally which leads to a, a lower reproductive rate uh, which, whereby eventually sort of the risk of over overpopulation will be reduced as well and all of these are wonderful developments that's why i think there are good reasons um, good replies we have to all the people who stress um, challenges or who see transhumanism as the world's most dangerous idea Right, right. So, so thank you for explaining this, Stefan. Would you also be able to define the concept of post-humanism? What do you actually mean by that? 
and, and what is the post human society going to look like okay um there are different notions of how post humanism is is understood that's why i'm sort of a bit um <laughs> hesitant right now and, and, and sort of post humanism if in, in in france for example post humanism is a strand of transhumanism but that doesn't that does not really correspond to the more academic understanding or to the self understanding within academic debates of what post humanism about some people have a different understanding of post humanism um, and and that can be rather explained by by means of this is rather something which i call which i think is more 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 adequately called carbonate based transhumanism so there are two different types of transhumanism there are carbonate based transhumanisms and silicon based transhumanism The silicon-based transhumanism sees sort of the future of human development, the future of personal development in a in a carbonate-based un- uh, existence. So in an in an existence with an organic body. So we develop further, probably initially by means of by means of genetic modifications. We become the transhuman. We become the posthuman. But there was still embodied organic. an embodied man would be an organic embodiment we so it's it's a further evolutionary organic development and that would be a carbonate based transhumanism who sees the further development towards a posthuman more in an organic development the the silicon based the silicon based transhumanism on the other hand that goes goes along more closely with elon musk who's you know the the most famous transhumanism in the world peter thiel ray kurzweil and and many people in the in silicon valley and they they particularly they don't exclude the carbonate based but they particularly highlight a silicon based transhumanism and a silicon based transhumanism sees the post human rather as a downloaded personality as by putting down you know the the idea is maybe it, there's also a carbonate based development but the idea is to eventually by means of neuralink by means of establishing brain computer interfaces to download the personality onto a hard drive so initially you get access to 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 the internet to all the information by means of a brain computer invasive or non invasive brain computer interface and then eventually even the parts of the our personality of who we are they can be digitized then they can be um, extrapolated they can be uploaded we can be transcended that's been talked about in many netflix series in many in many amazon prime series so um so the difference between a carbonate based transhumanism is which stresses the relevance of an organic organic uh, further enhancement evolutionary development by means of most probably genome editing and related sources and the other option stresses and the the silicon based transhumanism stresses our further development by means of us becoming digital entities by means of us getting up created by means of us getting turning into up uploaded minds um and and the post human existence would be one where we basically live on a on a hard drive of a computer so that's that's that is sort of the debate on the most important movements going going along with transhumanism post humanism so post humanism and post sometimes silicon based transhumanism is called post humanism which is i think a misleading way of talking about it sometimes in france i think that is quite a dominant way of talking about it however um post humanism in the academic debate would rather be related to post modern understanding critical post humanism which is which is not primarily concerned with the ethics of emerging technology it also deals with it but it is primarily concerned with with the implications of interpreting it interpreting uh, the world in a in a in a non-dualist manner of trying to twist to move away from the categorical ontological dualities like good and evil material immaterial soul and body and reinterpret us as non-dualistic entities um and 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 transhumanism on the other hand it's about an evolutionary development taking evolutionary seriously affirming the technologies in order to break beyond the 
boundaries of our current boundaries and why should we break beyond our current limitations and boundaries because in this way we increase the likelihood of our flourish flourishing of personal flourishing so we use technologies in order to become a trans a post-human and by doing so we increase the likelihood of us living better lives and that is the underlying idea of transhumanism and how this can be achieved whether our future post-human existence will be will be a, an organic a, a, a bodily one an organic one with an organic body um, the ones who see that as most likely are called carbonate based transhumanists and the ones who see the goal of us becoming having a silicon based body of of uh, of downloading our personality onto a hard drive they would be seen as a um, a silicon based transhumanist and and this is but what all the critical posthumanists and transhumanists do have in common is basically they all move away from a a categorically dualist ontolo an ontology which refers to our our human nature as being related in some essence in some immaterial essence all of that is is and and moving away from that immaterial essence that is what is called post-human paradigm shift and after the post-human paradigm shift there are various beyond humanism movements coming about one of them transhumanism critical post-humanism there's also meta-humanism so we are all moving away from that categorically ontol ontological duality moving away from having an essence an eternal essence and taking seriously the notion that that you know the world life that's a constant flux everything's in the process of permanent becoming and um, permanent becoming means there is no fixed and stable human nature anymore even humans other animals plants we are all in the state of permanent becoming and now we've got the possibility to and, and to alter our becoming and and we the question is being raised how we should do whether we should do so and what the, what are the limitations of, of of us doing so and how we can increase the great plurality of flourishing by means of these technologies in a sustainable manner such that it takes into consideration global justice social justice and that um that you know the quality of life of persons all over the world can be improved oh thank you for explaining it so beautifully and, and like you said i think we humans are sitting in such a fantastic cusp of time where we need to embrace this change we are constantly evolving and you know we need to embrace the change i think that's the only way we keep on growing uh you've written a book which says that we humans have always been cyborgs can you elaborate on that yeah thank you thanks a lot for that question so yes that is one of the decisive uh, turns in our self-understanding which i think we should take seriously and realize at all um so the cyborg turn has already been around in in both transhumanism as well as in in the critical post-humanist debates um, um and and i'm i'm bringing these day debates together sort of i praise elements of transhumanism of critical post-humanism by stressing that we've always been cyborgs and i think that's an in, in, enormously important insight so how did we how how did we in the in particular in the judeo christian tradition conceptualize ourselves as human beings our self conceptualization was and that comes out particularly clearly let's say in the in the catholic church um the catholic church so we receive our unchanging nature our natural essence and our natural essence is our immaterial rationality at the time of fertilization so when egg and sperm come together it's not just a bodily it's not just an organic process according since 1869 that's when the pope sort of stressed this is how human beings come about since in, in 1869 he stressed so it's not just sperm and egg coming together at the same time it happens animation animation means the rational immaterial soul is getting connected to the human body and once the rational rational immaterial soul gets connected to the body the body receives dignity personhood needs to be respected that is the traditional story of of how we became animated animated entities how we received the rational divine spark and now by stressing that we've always been cyborgs 
It is a counter narrative. It's a narrative which explains that this is, you know, it is highly implausible, you know, from a naturalist evolutionary perspective to say, well, there was, you know, something in the outside in the material realm, which takes something which then associate the material spark to the body. That's not a not a very scientific way. That's not a very plausible way of conceptualizing it. But we take seriously the notion that we in the in a process of permanent becoming a different narrative, a different story is needed. So we've always been cyborgs. A cyborg, what is a cyborg? A cyborg is a kubernetic organism. Cy stands for kubernetic, cybernetic, or organism. Organism, it's clear what is, it's an, you know, sort of that embodied carbonate based organism, bodily organism. That's what organism stands for. And cyber, cyber comes from the ancient Greek work kiber, Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the helm span, the steers person of a ship, the one who's responsible on making alteration, modifications in a ship, the one who steers a ship. So a cyborg is a steered organism, an altered organism. And when does the appropriate form of alteration towards learning, acquiring knowledge takes place, acquiring rationality take place? So according to the Judeo-Christian tradition, it is God placing the material rational spark, attaching it to our body, to the standard way of reading it at least. Um, and, and the cyborg, on the other hand, presents a counter narrative. It says, how did we develop rationality? Rationality and rationality is is language, our words, our way of making making inferences, of making judgments, combining judgments, and 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 making inferences, making scientific reflections, and all this. So, how did we develop language? Language is the first steering process which occurs to humans when. When a human baby is born, a baby cannot speak. It has 300,000 years what happened. There was a genetic mutation which takes place, which was a prerequisite for humans developing a brain which is capable of language. So it was a genetic mutation which occurred 300,000 years ago, which, 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 which was a prerequisite which enables us to have an pre organic prerequisite for developing language. And, but when we're actually born, we don't have language. The parents, our, our, our family structures, our cultural surroundings upgrade us. We learn the mother tongue. That's how we initially acquire language. It's an upgrade. It is us being steered, hence cyber, us being steered and thus we develop language and then and then we go to school and in school we develop further the use of language we know the history we learn mathematics we learn philosophy reflections so it is a further upgrading process is a further modification process is a further enhancement process education is a type of enhancement just in the way as a vaccination is a type of enhancement and these are all steering processes so we received rationality and rationality together with rationality our our capacity to speak to reflect to make inferences um not by means of some external immaterial event but by means of dynamic educative processes by means of our parents upgrading us with language and then by going to school we gain further knowledges and information and so so by realizing and by stressing that we've always been cyborgs it is being stressed that no the traditional narrative that we become animated we reach the ra rational soul by some external immaterial intervention is not a plausible story what is what is a more plausible story that we developed our capacity of language use by means of a genetic mutation which took place 300,000 years ago by means of which homo sapiens came about and then we permanently need to upgrade again and again by our parents by our 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 family by our by our um, cultural structures and 
if we realize this, if we realize that basically language is an internal technology, just as getting getting a smartphone is an external technology, it's another way of getting upgraded. So um, the use of smartphones, of 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 using an avatar in 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 the metaverse. Um, using a genetic modification. That's all in tune with what we've always been doing as human beings. These are further upgrades. And usually these upgrades, if used in the appropriate manner, they increase the likelihood of, of us living good lives. So the, the central narrative, the central paradigm shift was, which is occurring is traditionally our notion was we've had, a, we've had an immaterial essence an unchanging essence, which which is our our human nature, which is in the divine spark, in, which is in a, in a rational in our rational soul. That is a traditional narrative, and now, and now the counter narrative is no. It is a dynamic process, and we receive develop the capacity of language of our mental capacity as a part of upgrading process. So it's it's a concept of an embodied mind. So. We've got an embodied mind which came about evolutionary, when which needs further steering and education all the time. Furthermore, we need to realize that our body is actually, so the mind is a part of the body and our body consists of more non-human cells than human cells. Our body consists of 39 trillion non-human cells, bacteria and so on, and 30 trillion human cells with our genetic, with our DNA inside. And the non-human cells are mostly in our guts, in our in intestines. So um, we don't even, where are the boundaries of who we are? It used to be clear with the divine spark. Now it is completely unclear. Um, what about the smartphone? The smartphone, if you've got a cochlear implant, for example, and the cochlear implant, um, um, in order to, you need to choose a, different program if you want to listen to a presentation outside if you want to have a discussion in a room if you you know um you always need to choose a different uh, program on the smartphone so if a police woman comes and takes takes away the smartphone from someone with a cochlear implant it's basically taking away the cognitive capacities of the person so so here we can see the smartphone is already seen as a type of extended mind it can be seen as as being part of the body and furthermore, um, as a next process, it would be sort of our avatar, the avatars which we use, which we, we which we steer, which are part of us in in the second in second life, fifteen years ago, or now in the metaverse. Um, if if these avatars are being touched by other avatars, and we don't want to be touched by these avatars, again, it for many that that is a way of seeing no. They are, they, are, they are infringing upon our, our bodily boundaries. On a, um, they, they are doing harm to our body. So maybe even the avatar can be seen as part of our body. Maybe the smartphone can. And, and, our, body, and our body consists of human and, and as well as non-human cells, even more non-human cells than human cells. So it is, it is a, it's a new way. It's a more hybrid way, way of seeing uh, seeing the human body in permanent interaction with the external world without having clear understanding of the boundaries in the state of permanent becoming without, um, you know, having an unchanging natural ass essence, which we used to believe in. So this is all of this goes along with the post-human post -human paradigm shift. And the and and the decisive uh, understanding that no, our human nature does not lie in an immaterial, rational, divine spark, but in the realization that we've always been cyborgs, and that our rationality has be is is an up is the result of an upgrading process. Right. In the course of the conversation, you mentioned that you know, I mean, transhumanism. You describe it as carbonate-based transhumanism, as silicon-based uh, transhumanism. Silicon-based transhumanism is, is still very, very far away because for that we'll have to possibly understand the human brain, and then we'll need a system where we can uh, maybe scan the entire human brain, upload it or in, into a computer, uh, and and and, it's, and so that's still far away. Though that that you mentioned that companies like Elon Musk and many others are working on brain-computer interface and possibly uh, are just at the nascent stage of understanding uh, you know how do we do this uh, two-way communication from the human brain to the computer and vice versa carbon based you know because there, there are a lot of these uh, humans who have already uh, 
started tinkering around and there's a lot of these technology stack which is helping us do that you know and uh, you you spoke about how genetic technology is helping you know uh extending human life lifespan you know genetic technology is, is now being used crispr cas9 editing is being used across uh, uh lots lots of uh interventions for healthcare Can can you talk about the benefits of transhumanism? You know, while we are at it, you know, possibly tinkering around, maybe in individual basis, trying to understand how we humans can actually augment ourselves. What are going to be the the long term benefits of these? And maybe if you could highlight the long term benefits of this, that'll be like really really nice. Yeah. So, as the one thing which most of us at least have in common, which we identify as in, an increased quality of life. And that's by if we live longer and if we live longer healthily, that is what most people identify with an increased life uh, quality of life. And that's what in transhumanism is called with an increased health span. So increasing a health span is is one of the central goals of um which which transhumanist which which all transhumanists share. And that can be achieved in a great variety of 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 ways. And one example basically which I think is an extremely promising way for doing so again has to do with the interaction of cyborg technologies and and organic and gene technologies. So at Tufts University about 5 years ago, 6 years ago, and they developed an RFID chip, a small chip which which um which moves into the body what they've shown is like an rfid chip which which can be placed on the front teeth a tooth mounted sensor so whenever whenever you eat something whenever you eat anything um it analyzes exactly what you've eaten so last year last last night the pizza and the beer you know that was not if you want to le- live long healthily then maybe you should eat some salad today and drink some water instead analyze because sort of uh, and and analyzing how how what you've eaten affects you and and that is so we need to find correlations between digital data and 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 uh, what we eat and how we end our bodily constitution how it affects our body how it affects our qualities and and if we're doing so um we need a lot of data and data analysis and that it can that this has an enormous potential for increasing the life expectancy for increasing the health span um can be shown by reference to predictive maintenance in machines so the sensors are moving into our bodies and by means of the sensors we can realize a predictive maintenance of human of of personal health and predictive maintenance of personal health basically so shows well your body is still functional you don't have diabetic diabetes uh, beatis you 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 don't have high blood pressure you don't have and so on however the measures show if you continue to live and act and if you don't do anything then you will um develop a high blood pressure um fairly soon so and it warns us and we can intervene we can change our lives we can take we can take drugs in order to prevent this from taking place and sort of the predictive maintenance of a human body it already takes place right now for example when it comes to high blood pressure high blood pressure um the there the, the was a, what counted as high blood pressure in the past um was different from what counts high blood pressure nowadays So in the past it used to be well with a you know 160 to to 110 or 100 it it still used to be seen in in many parts of the world as as you being fine as not having high blood pressure. So and then what the physicians did they lowered the expectancies. So you already had high blood pressure from 140 to whatever goes beyond 140 to 90. And um, and so as a consequence people were encouraged to take pl- high blood pressure pills already at a state when 20 years ago they were regarded as as healthy and by taking blood pressure pills the likelihood of the people from dying from strokes and heart heart attacks gets gets lowered 
And and so this is the this is our ni uh, initial processes of predictive maintenance of our of our bodies. And now by means if the sensors move into our bodies, we can clearly analyze even further um, how how our behavior, how certain substances, our food, um, how they affect our health and how we can change it. And we can intervene by means of genetic modifications, by means of developing new drugs, by means of, by means of new vaccinations, by means of so in so many different ways. And, and there are also new drugs which are being developed and new drugs are being developed, for example, against high blood pressure. Traditionally, the way to deal with high blood pressure is you lower you render so in if, if if the veins and arteries are getting blocked um what what physicians are doing they prescribe a medicine which renders the blood more liquid so they reduce the the likelihood of of strokes and heart attacks are getting reduced an alternative way at alternative medicines which are being developed well you develop the a, a, a drug a, a medicine which basically unblocks unplugs the arteries the veins um and 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 i know that some companies are working on that so the idea is basically from the idea from from the age of 40 everyone takes such a say takes such a takes such a pill and you need to get the price to the pill down to you know down to a good price and then what it does it sort of frees your blocks freeze it, it it sort of liberates the blocks the potential blocks into the veins and the arteries and as a consequence you don't even need to take any any blood thinner but sort of it it it, it keeps you it 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 increases the likelihood of you living living healthily more longer so that these are a different ways so that so but the most funda fundamental element for all of these processes is before we can intervene by means of drugs and uh, gene modifications and other ways, we need data. Data is the fundamental element concerning concerning developing new drugs, developing new new technologies, new treatments, and so on. And we need to have technologies which analyze correlations between bodily processes, gene processes, and technological and external interventions. And that's why economists, so many economists now stress, well, data are the new oil, because it's not, well, data is not oil. Um, oil is a natural substance, data is intellectual property. However, they both fulfill the same function. The function of power, inf you know, information is power, is money, is influence, and and so data is the central element for increasing our personal health span. Um, and so um, the focus is on generating data, and that's why that there's even a global war concerning data taking place right now, because only with the data we can influence, we can increase uh, the the great plurality of personal flourishing and and this is one example to show how we can increase now the personal quality um, the personal quality of life at the same time and that is now concerned sort of the personal quality but at the same time we need to take into consideration well we need the good you know the global circumstances the natural circumstances also need to be taken into consideration so alternative ways of food production are needed and again, I've I've known a friend of mine. I met him when he was still, you know, very young. He, he gave a presentation in in Taiwan at the age of you know 15, 16, um, and and he, he of Indian origin and but living in Silicon Valley. And he's part of a he's part of a wonderful project called um, Real Vegan Cheese. And his his group has been using CRISPR CRISPR Cas9 genome editing technologies on yeast. In order to turn yeast into into lactose, and on the basis of lactose, so the lactose doesn't come from the milk, from cow's milk, but um, the lactose actually can produce milk, which is like ident chemically identical to cow's milk, but it doesn't come from the cow, but because it, it's genetically modified yeast, 
And on the basis of that lactose, you can create real vegan cheese. So you don't have to use almond milk or you don't have to, you know, which doesn't taste like cow's milk cheese. But you, by means of genetic modification, you can turn yeast into lactose. On the basis of lactose, you can create, you know, real lactose milk and, and cheeses. And that is what they're doing. And as a consequence, we don't need to have this. So if all of these things work out, for example, we don't need this, you know, anymore, the factory farming, factory farming getting reduced, factory farming um, getting connected to the pollution, pollution of the soil, to carbon dioxide emissions, antibiotics being given to the animals. That again is increasing the likelihood of antibiotic resistant cells coming about and many other challenges. So instead we develop in vitro meat and that has been legalized in Singapore now in the United States. We develop a, a real vegan milk, real vegan cheese on the basis of genetic modifications. We, we print out steaks by means of by means of bioprinters. This is how steaks are being developed. We can already develop artificial salmon and um, and so um, and 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 so on the one hand we improve the personal quality of, of human lives by means of predictive maintenance of the bodies on the other hand we take take into consideration that is in order for personal flourishing what is needed is also a sustainable growth we need to take into to consideration non-human animals and the environment and this can be done, for example, by moving away from factory farming, by developing alternative means of food production by means of genetic uh, genetic modification, for example. Right. Thank you for sharing all the details. And I think nations, institutions need to relook at how we consume and produce things, you know, because there was this the entire way of natural versus unnatural. But I think I, I don't even understand what's natural anymore because and, and uh, the, the way the lines are blurring, I think the, we need to accept things because that's the only way we'll be able to feed the growing population, the, the global population. And through this help of technology, you know, where you spoke about how uh, we 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 getting variables, you know, which is... Uh, uh, enabling and augmenting things, uh, uh, humans, and, and we've always been augmenting ourselves, like you said, you know, through history, through medicines, through blood thinners, through cochlear implants, through prosthetic limbs, uh, through genetic modified uh, food, and so on and so forth. So I think the world needs to understand that the world is, I mean, uh, that the population is growing rapidly and and for the, the population to flourish uh, uh, and sustainably we need to leverage these post humanism and, and go ahead with the time professor really really appreciate you taking time and being part of the question my last question to you what's your future plan and advice to listeners what is actually coming out in very soon is 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 a, is a book on is a, an essay collection which was put together by um, uh, two colleagues and it's de dedicated to an introduction to sort of a summary of many of the ideas I've presented over the years. It's called Metahumanism, Eurotranshumanism and Sorgnus Philosophy. So I'm, I'm very happy about that because this is really addresses, this addresses many different elements of um, many different elements of, of 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 the thinking I've presented over over the years, so it it, it presents a Euro transhumanism. So far, many of the ideas which have been presented or which are associated with transhumanism are sort of the classical transhumanism, and the classical transhumanism is very much focused on this silicon. Uh, silicon-based post-human entities. It's very much related to a utilitarian way of thinking. It is very much the way to utopian versions and utopias have always been extremely dangerous. You sacrifice the present for a future which can never be realized. Um, it is It is usually be this utilitarian Anglo-American way of thinking instead of instead of really taking 
um, taking this non-dualist entity uh, ontology of becoming seriously, trying to develop visions, but realistic visions, realistic visions which don't aim for perfect utopias, which aim is more a pragmatic way of, of, of progressing. So that's what I call a Euro transhumanism. And um, so the initial ideas have already been presented in response in, a, in an essay collection forthcoming now entitled Meta Humanism, Euro Transhumanism, and Sorgnes Philosophy. And in, in order to show well one shouldn't transhumanism is 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 more than just mind uploading it's more than you know the the, the, the trying to realize a perfect utopia um it is it is much more it takes more into consideration issues like global justice social justice the the great plurality of 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 personal flourishing it takes into good it aims for realistic visions of the future and 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 takes it takes a very high humble understanding concerning who we are as human beings, that there should be personhood for non-human animals. And um, so um, this is what I'm this is what I'm I'm, I'm working on and I'm trying to pre pre also show sort of the, the difference in approaches and alternative ways which hopefully also resonate in because the traditional classical transhumanism one of the one of the prejudices from concerning classical transhumanism has been well that's just for silicon valley and for for switzerland it's only the rich will benefit and sort of what euro transhumanism does is a cloakal approach which takes into consideration um, uh, the local local particularities and a more and a, um uh, and a non-utopian, non-anthropocentric way of thinking, a non, in particular, non-utopian way of thinking about uh, about sort of transhumanist issues. And what I'm what I'm trying to stress is sort of you know people in the various in the various parts of the world also need, one needs to develop local approaches, a local approach which is valid. I've I've had an I've organized an event last year on transhumanism in Africa. So encouraging friends of mine are a transhumanist from Nigeria. So um so sort of a specific transhumanism appropriate for a Nigerian context needs to be developed, needs to be taken in, into consideration. So it would be there are already some Af uh, there's Afrofuturism, but Afrofuturism is again a separate take. There might might be a new, you know, Nigerian transhumanism. I'm working with a scholar from from South America, from Chile. Again, you have to face with different with different um, issues which are particularly relevant for the local uh, for the local circumstances. So I, I stress the need to approach local approaches. Um, which take some elements from, you know, transhumanism as a general enterprise, but w which also take the, the local particularities into consideration. But local scholars are needed to con take that into consideration and to developing these issues further. And um, it's a way of, you know, stressing the plurality and divergence in different parts of the world and, you know, um, and trying to show and trying to, you know, move the discussion away. There's more than just mind uploading and the typical uh, Silicon Valley ideas to the classical transhumanism. And, and there are many dangers also, in particularly in the libertarian framing of, of what many of these classical transhumanists have in mind, which could actually lead to a, um, to, to, to more high, um, uh, to, to, to a hierarchization in society. So um, um, by working with local scholars, stressing and presenting some, some global elements of transhumanism, but stressing the need do take the local particularities into consideration, and and thus we can actually realize um, properly realize the great plurality of of personal flourishing. Um, it also it's also a way of trying to show well, it's not just you know the the, the standard the standard framing of of classical transhumanism. That's not all. What all? That's not all. Um, the the goals. Uh, th this is not all about transhumanism. There, there, there's much more to it, and so it's not. So whoever identifies with transhumanism, with mind uploading, uh, with the goal of reaching one specific utopian society, 
and and uh, with the goal of us turning into Renaissance man or Superman and Wonder Woman on Wonder Woman on Botox and 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 Superman on Viagra. That's that's it, 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 a wrong way of conceptualizing transhumanism, which is going along with this you know, Silicon Valley Oxford based understanding. And we need a more more plural way of understanding that by taking local particularities into consideration. And we was my me with my European background I'm I'm developing this European euro transhumanism which takes some critical posthumanist elements into consideration and 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 I encourage people to show the relevance of some elements like an increased health span that's something which is relevant in all parts of the world or not doing direct harm to another person that's relevant in all parts of the of the world and and technology uh, nature culture not being a categorically binary distinction you know these are elements which are widely you know apply however then the p particularities need to be developed by the local scholars who are familiar with the pedi cultural pedigrees in their specific setup and so it's it's a way of finding a new path towards a more pluralistic understanding of transhumanism by presenting in particular a euro transhumanist approach Thank you for taking time and being part of the podcast. I hope this will at least to a bunch of those listeners maybe change their mind of what transhumanism is, you know, because like in the beginning of the conversation, I said, you know, when you Google or YouTube for transhumanism, it's, it's largely negative. And I think you've painted a picture on how this is a culture which, you know, it's taking everyone rather than it, 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 what the Swiss transhumanism w w w was all about. This is about taking people, enabling everyone and and, and empowering everyone. So, so uh, Please keep on doing what you're doing. You know, we need more such people such as yourself who creates the right awareness and the right narrative so it goes to the larger uh, 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 audience. Uh, so I really appreciate you doing what you're doing. And my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this. And thanks for your kindness. You've been a wonderful host. <laughs>